Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Flying Cat Marketing interview series. Today I have Farzad Rashidi, who's a leading innovator at Respona, the all-in-one link building outreach software that helps businesses increase organic traffic from Google. Previously, he ran the marketing efforts at Visme, where he helped the company gain over 14 million active users and pass 3 million monthly organic traffic. So very excited to talk to you today. Farzad, how's it going? It's going very well. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's rare, actually, that I have guests that I talk about SEO with. We're always talking about different, like we talk a lot about content or growth or other kind of marketing things, uh, content operations, but I'm really glad that we can really just get into it with, with the SEO talk. Uh, Sounds so great. Me, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, we're, we're going to dive in straight away. Um, tell me, tell me what you did. How did you get these 14 million? <laughs> Today we're actually sure going to talk about, I know we're going to talk about on page and we're going to talk about keywords and those kind of things. And we might actually have a second episode where we're talking about off page and link building. And today let's just keep it to on page. So, um, sure thing. tell me about your, 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 your biggest plays here. Sure. No problem. So I, I started my career, uh, uh, maybe I was at our parent company called Visme. Have you heard of Visme before? Yes. Have you used our platform at all? I think I might have tried it once. <laughs> okay, perfect. Awesome. So for folks who don't know what Visme is, it's an all-in-one uh, visual content creation tool for brands. So if you're a company, you're looking to create like presentations and reports, proposals, you can create really good-looking, professional-looking uh, graphics within a matter of a few minutes. Uh, now, the main reason, or I would say main aspect of our platform that's different from Canva is that we're predominantly focused on businesses versus Canva. That's more of a D2C platform built for everyone. So uh, that we, we that the company was started back in 2013, and it was basically a bunch of engineers and designers who put together a product. And uh, when I joined the company, I was the first marketing hire. So we had no acquisition strategy or any sort of, you know, I would say marketing plan uh, per se. So I was tasked with figuring that out, figuring that out. They're like, basically, we built this product, go sell this thing. <laughs> so we, we, we did, you know, went through a few different acquisition uh, channels and kind of decided to uh, land on SEO. And, and, and that's one good thing to also remember is that if you're an agency, one of the ways that you could kind of uh, discover whether SEO is the right channel for, for the business that you're working with is basically understanding two questions. And one, whether or not the customers, potential customers of that business are actually aware of the problem that, that the business is solving. And if so, where are they actually looking to solve that problem? And if the answer to the first question is yes, they're aware of the problem and they're looking for those answers on Google, then that means that SEO is definitely, it's almost idiotic not to focus on it. But as a matter of fact, most businesses that I've seen, SEO is probably not the right strategy for them. Like, for example, if you're a T-shirt company, for example, or apparel company, um, are people actively Googling for buying T-shirts? Probably not. You know, your best bet is probably making TikTok videos and going on, I don't know, running Facebook ads, etc. I'm, I'm horrible at paid ads. But um, but basically, it, it seems to be the proper channel just simply because it's, it's not something that you normally would create content for. Not to say it's impossible, uh, but it, it means that the resources are better spent elsewhere. Or if you, for example, are a medical device company and you sell like super expensive like uh, devices, it's just something that people aren't actively Googling to find is it's, uh, probably your best bet is cold average. So go hire a bunch of salespeople, go door to door. Now, Visme, we're in a a very particular position where we had a very affordable product. So it was, I think at the time, it's like $15 a month or something. So it's not something that it makes economic sense to go hire salespeople for. Or on the other hand, to focus a ton on pay downs because some of our competitors like Canva had raised like hundreds of millions of dollars at the time. So it would become very competitive and difficult as a bootstrap company to compete with. Plus there's a um, diminishing ROI. So, you know, when you double your Budget doesn't mean you get double the conversion. So normally cost for acquisition uh, catches up with the LTV very quickly. So we basically decided to focus all of our efforts on our SEO. So 
we started, you know, um, working with some writers. We put together some content pieces and uh, blog posts and, you know, what people were talking about at the time. Uh, and, and guess what happened? What? Nothing. What <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely <Yes>. cricket. <laughs> yeah. So we needed Miva to help us understand uh, yeah. some of the things that we that we're going to talk about today. But but yeah. So that sort of um, sparked the idea of uh, figuring out. Okay, maybe we should first understand what we're doing wrong here because as a bootstrap company, we had spent like months building all these assets, and they were getting absolutely no traffic, but very little. I think we had like two visitors. I'm sure one of them was my mom. And <laughs> it was just not a very uh, wise choice of um, uh, investment. So what we what we basically figured out was that we were attacking the problem the wrong way. So a lot of businesses, when they get started with SEO, they're like, hey, here are some key terms we, that we want to rank for. So let's go create pages for them and then basically put it on our website and it will magically get rankings. And it turns out in real life, this is not normally how it works. So there's, there's a lot more science involved when it comes to picking the right keywords first and building the right site structure uh, to, to match user intent. Okay, so what is that? What is this this play? So I, I also understand, of course, it's a lot more than just picking keywords. And that's something that people try all the time. They're like, oh, we write some pieces, then we found some keywords, we put it in it later, or we build a small list of keywords and we're just gonna build a couple pages and, oh, we did that. SEO doesn't work, it's not a good channel. <laughs> um, and so I have <laughs> yeah. my opinions. I'm here to hear your experience sure. and what it is that you did instead. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a variety of different ways, but, but here's a very good rule of thumb uh, that I've sort of put together also in a little ebook that I wrote where it gives a blueprint and step-by-step instructions for any business that has determined that, hey, SEO is the right channel, it's worth the investment now, how do we actually go attack this problem? So what the steps that we follow, even to this day at Visme and at Rishbana, both companies, is that we run a parent keyword. So any business has a parent keyword. So for example, for, for Visme, it was at the time, Viz infographics and presentations. For Respond it's link building, SEO, right? So there's these parent keywords that basically kind of sort of explains what the business is in, in, in one or two words. Now, these are extremely high volume, normally super competitive keywords. So what we normally do is that we run these parent keywords through an SEO tool like Ahrefs or SEMrush, or if you're in just starting out, you know, more affordable tools like Uber Suggest, et cetera. There's a gazillion of them out there. They normally give you hundreds of thousands of keyword suggestions that are relevant to those parent terms. So for example, for um, infographics or presentations, like presentation, how to make a presentation, how to deliver a presentation, or how do I make a presentation, right? Um, so basically there's a variety of different keywords that are catered for um, uh, uh, I would say uh, different stages of the buyer journey. But the, the biggest thing, because you can always find a lot of keywords, there's an infinite number of them out there. How do you go about prioritizing these? Because any business has limited amount of resources. Yeah. So that prioritization process becomes about uh, becomes very important. So what the process that we use for prioritization is actually somewhat interesting because I, I think people, especially as I'm sure you guys do this also uh, instinctively, but this is something that we sort of put together a formula for uh, that we used to call, well, I call it the farms at school. Uh, but our team was like, no. You <laughs> call it what? Call, <laughs> we're not calling this the Farzot score. We're going to call this the, the opportunity <laughs> score. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, short version is not to speak in nerd terms, but speaking plain English. If you want to ideally prioritize keywords, the first, get a good amount of volume. So it's not keywords that have nobody's actively looking for. So that's just common sense. You get some level of volume, highest amount of volume possible, lowest amount of competition. So it's not dominated by the big guys, something that's within our grasp. But most important of all, have the highest amount of commercial intent. So the overlap here is the is what we call the opportunity keyword. So we ideally want to prioritize our keyword list based on all these three factors combined. 
Mm -hmm. because none of them are a good factor to judge by themselves, right? Because you can always create content that gets a lot of volume, it's irrelevant to your business. Or you can create content that is super relevant to your business, but nobody's looking for it on Google. So all of them are useless. So we got to make sure that it, it hits all three chords. So what we do basically is to run, extract this list of keywords, we put them in a little Google sheet, and I attribute each one of these factors to a certain metric. So for example, for volume, we use the traffic potential, uh, which is basically the amount of organic traffic that the first uh, uh, ranking yeah. page on that keyword gets. Because you shouldn't just rely on the organic, I would say, volume for that keyword, just simply because normally posts rank for multiple keywords at the same time, longer tail you're, variations. You're preaching, preaching to the choir, Farzad. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. I'm sure you notice it's more so geared towards the listeners, maybe. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, you guys yeah, yeah. are doing this already and well aware. So we normally use a traffic potential as a metric for judging, okay, hey, if we were to get rank number one for this keyword, how much are we tra how much traffic are we talking here? Um, two is the, uh, uh, the competition, which is the easiest one. Uh, a lot of these SEO tools give you a score. It's called keyword difficulty from zero to 100. 100 is super competitive. Don't go near it. Zero is super low competitive. Obviously, you want to prioritize these. Uh, so that's something that we want to prioritize, obviously, based on the lower, the better. So we kind of have that in a reverse metric. So basically have one over keyword difficulty. And the last metric for commercial intent is a little bit more tricky because that's something that's not really talked about when it comes to SEO because you're only talking about organic traffic. But a metric that I like to use for that is actually the CPC for that keyword. And the reason why we use it is because advertisers like to make money. So if, if advertisers are willing to pay for traffic to come through those keywords, that is an indication that that's a commercially valuable uh, keyword. So we ideally want to prioritize an organic calendar keywords that have the highest amount of CPC possible. So once you multiply these together, which is number of traffic potential mul multiplied by one over keyword difficulty, multiplied by one plus cost per click. And the reason why I do one plus is sometimes cost per click zero. So we don't want to rule those keywords out. So we just want to make it neutral. Um, that gives you a score. That doesn't mean anything on its own. And one process, one thing that I also missed during this whole thing is um, is is a great rule of thumb that has no scientific basis, but it's worked very well for us. And that is extract or removing all the keywords before you even plug it into the formula with a keyword difficulty of higher than your domain rating. Yeah. Meaning That's in plain English. Don't shoot for the start, all right? Stay within your league. So if you're a small website starting out with a low domain rating, um, you want to start going after some of the keywords that have lower uh, competition. And as that domain rating grows over time, we're going to talk about how you do that in the second episode where we talk about off-page SEO. Uh, then you can go after some of the more higher competitive keywords, which normally are either more commercially valuable or higher in traffic. So either way, uh, you extract the keywords that are out of your league, <laughs> and then to prioritize the rest, you plug it into this formula, which we call the opportunity score, and then that you just sort descending. Now that score on its own doesn't really tell you anything, but what it's a relative metric. So basically saying that, hey, for all these keywords under this parent category or this silo, here are the keywords that you need to prioritize. Now you go through each one one by one and use your best uh, judgment. So you run these each one of these keywords through a little incognito tab in your browser. The reason why we use the incognito tab is because we don't want our previous search history to be impacting the type of results that come up. Because when I go search for something, respond is always at the top because I always click on our own article. So to remain unbiased, we kind of I run it through a little uh, incognito search. And then just take a look and see the type of search results that come up. And normally the user intent is quite clear. So for example, if somebody is looking for how do I present a, or how do I memorize a presentation, they're probably looking for a guide, an educational material that kind of explains how, what are some of the best ways to create um, or memorize a presentation. Or if somebody is looking for presentation templates, it's unlikely they're looking for a blog post. They're probably looking to download something or actually create something so it's, it's a template page. Or if they're looking for presentation software, they're likely either looking for listicles or they're looking for a landing page or what we call these money pages where they're basically 
looking to sign up for products that are at the very bottom of the funnel. So based on each one of these user intent, you want to create a page that correlates with that. And basically, it could be a blog post, it could be a template page, it could be a, a landing page, doesn't matter. So it's not all just creating blog posts. And then basically, that gives you a very good basis when it comes to keyword research. And then we can get into some of the more nerdy stuff when it comes to internal linking and all that good stuff. Okay, amazing. So just so I get it straight, you have these different metrics, which were CPC, traffic potential, keyword difficulty. What else? Are those That's the it. three metrics? Yeah. Yeah. And then that you put... The, that's the what makes the score. Do you give different weightage to each of those things? You could. I mean, it depends on um, what type of business you're running. You could, you know, it's a formula and you multiply them together. So if you want to put different weights on... You multiply intent, them together. You multiply them together, yeah. So if you want to put okay. more weight on commercial intent or on traffic. So we can get a little more targeted on that. So we also don't just create content for the sake of creating content. So... At our companies, we create three types of content as well. So we put different ways on different keywords based on the type of content that we're looking to create. So we, we create content for SEO purposes. So these are content that are mainly at the brand awareness stage, where we're trying to just get our name out there for keywords that are relevant to us. So we don't necessarily care about CPC. And competition is normally higher or lower, depending on you know the type of industry that you're in. We're, we're trying to get some brand awareness. And these are normally top of the funnel content pieces, how-to articles, what what is articles, right, that are not, or glossary items. So these are type of content pieces that we don't care at all about CPC. We don't care if anybody. So we actually even take that out and we put more weight on the traffic potential. On the other hand, we have content pieces that are in the consideration stage. So these are content pieces that, um, uh, or excuse me, uh, let me, we can get a little more detailed there. But but the second type of content that we create is link content. So these are linkable assets where basically what we use as a bait to attract backlinks. So these are original research, um, surveys, right? Um, infographics that are cool, <laughs> that are basically still derived from... That you've designed research. with Visme? Yes, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> well, all the time at Visme, yes. But in response, yeah. sometimes we create some graphs, and et cetera. Um, and so these are content pieces that we don't care about the traffic at all. <laughs> this is uh, We don't really care about the competition or the CPC either, really. These are content pieces that are um, built for average. So these are content pieces that we're actually going to go pitch to publications to try to get some backlinks to. Okay. And the last step is what we call bottom of the funnel content pieces that are built for conversions. So those content pieces, we care a lot about CPC. We don't care at all about, you know, competition as much or the volume as much. For example, the term link building software <laughs> that Respond is ranking for. So uh, this is a very, very highly targeted item that we wanted to rank for uh, just simply because of the amount of um, um conversions that we're getting. So the way we sort of measure the success of our content pieces or pages is based on the objective. And so according to the purpose for each one of the content pieces that you're putting out, you can also assign different ways on each one of these three metrics. Okay. And so if they're all multiplied, then wouldn't the highest keyword difficulty score make it seem like it's a bigger priority? Shouldn't it be the That's lower keyword one over. difficulty? Oh, okay. It's divided by the That's right. keyword difficulty. Okay. So it's written reverse. Right. So the higher the keyword yeah. difficulty, okay. the lower the division. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. just so I make this simpler for folks who are listening, it's difficult to follow when, when I'm just talking, right? So uh, we I've actually put together an ebook. It's free. Uh, you guys can just Google Visme Marketing Strategy. I wrote that well, ebook we'll, myself. We'll link to it. Sure. Yes. We if can you link to find it in, in the show, show notes. notes. Yes. And, and then I have screenshots, step by step instructions with all these nerdy stuff in there. So you can just plug and play. Uh, but that hopefully is going to give you some background information before you dive in. Fantastic. So, OK. Excellent, excellent approach here. I love it. I resonate with it. I have a similar one. Um, but man, 14 million users, what was the time frame? Like when you joined, how many users 
where they are. And a sorry, few hundred thousand active users. users. This is active users as in active users from organic traffic or sub- subscribers to or what is what is that metric exactly? So we are a freemium platform. So meaning that a small percentage of these are actual paying customers. So active users, uh, users that have logged in uh, at least one time within the past month or something like that. So I, I'm okay. actually, don't quote me on that. So it's users that are actually still using our platform, uh, but not all of them are paying customers, a small percentage are. Okay. Okay, so the 3 million monthly organic traffic, how long did it take to get, when you joined, how much was it? And what was the time frame using this approach to get there? Yeah, so I can look that up for you, to be honest. I don't remember. It's been a while. <laughs> um, but yes, but it's not to say that I've done this. Um, I take very little credit <laughs> uh, just simply because. Well, I mean, you as in VizMe. That's right. Yeah. So basically, with the company was started in 2013, but they were in build mode. I, I believe we started um, building out the content and, and all that good stuff starting 2017 ish. So 2022. It's about five years. Five years. And yeah. so this was all done with your internal team or were yeah, you working so, with some freelancers? So we do. So here's how we structure our writing team. So we don't uh, we have some core writing uh, team members, our content managers. Uh, so these guys do write content by themselves, stuff that they feel passionate about. Uh, but their job is mainly um, quality assurance is not so much about is, and publishing and editing and and managing writers uh, that rather than writing content pieces themselves, uh, simply because when you're writing content pieces about different areas, um, you kind of don't want to just go repurpose stuff that's already written. Uh, so we normally delegate content pieces based on the area of expertise to different writers. So we have a network of writers that we work okay. with, uh, the freelancers that are passionate one of them are very interested in database right uh, some of them are interested in design others some some are interested in marketing so based on their area of expertise we delegate different content pieces and keywords for them to to write pieces for for us so i imagine it's slowly ramped up like you didn't start with the same amount of pieces that they were publishing by the time you got to three million but how many pages per month well, I guess you also had a lot of link building going on, which we'll be yeah. talking about, which definitely. So, yeah, yeah. So that's the, needle, the thing. But... So a lot of people are mostly aware of. So uh, here's the thing. Most companies, when they're focused on SEO, they get very bogged down on the keyword research process and the content creation aspect. Matter of fact, is what we found is that that's just 50% of the work. Um, a lot of people just stop there just simply because that's what's most comfortable, right? So as a company, you can spend the time and do the work yourself to go create a blog post, right? And and put in, pour your heart out. But as a matter of fact, like me, if you go on Google, for example, presentation software, all right, on Google, let's do it with me. Presentation software. Okay. Just Google it in a, in a new it. incognito window. Present in my incognito window? Yeah. Okay. Give me a second presentation. I wonder if I can share my screen on this software. No worries. Oh my God, so I can. So here's what I want to show you. How many search results come up right underneath the search bar? How many search results come up at the top when you when you look for it? Uh, well, I have I have one, two, three, four sorry. ads. Gotcha. So me, sorry uh, to interrupt you here. So right underneath it says globally how many web pages contain this keyword. Oh, this sorry. Is- it doesn't even say. Gotcha. This is the so I see server the number. Sometimes it doesn't show. It's 990 million search results, almost a billion. Yeah. With a B. Um, so once you create a really good piece of content, you have found a really good keyword. And let's say you're in the top 1% when it comes to quality of content, right? Top 1% is pretty good. <laughs> I think we can all yes. agree. When there's a billion search results, you're still in the millions. You're yeah. in the tenth millionth search, uh, at, you know, rank, which is pretty good because you're still in the top one percent. But that's nowhere near helpful to your business because you need to get in the top ten, which get ninety nine percent of the clicks. So that sort of is uh, what what sort of led us to uh, this conclusion that we need to have an proportionate focus 
on our promotion tactics because the way Google and and, and you know, back in the late '90s when Google basically uh, took over the search engine market uh, was based on this uh, algorithm they built uh, called PageRank, which basically uh, prioritizes the search engine based on a Mean Girls popularity contest. So the more relevant authoritative websites are linking back to you and actually meant talking about you, the more way they put on it when it comes to their search ranks because you can't just rely on the content on the page to judge the quality per se. And you need to also see how many people are actually referencing and talking about it. And so the way we distribute our resources in marketing is also proportionate to that. So we spend 20% of our marketing resources on content creation. The other 80% goes into promotion and link building. So, which is the exact opposite ratio how most companies do content marketing. And that's what's been really propelling us yeah. forward. Um, so what, what matters, I always businesses come, I, especially when they request a demo responder, like, hey, we don't have resources uh, for doing link building. I'm like, how many content pieces are generating? It's like, yeah, we just create, you know, a couple a week. I'm like a couple a week. I was like, stop producing so much damn content. Just produce really good piece of content once a month and spend the rest of that month promoting it. So all matters. It doesn't matter how much resources you have. Obviously, Visme produces a lot more content than Visme does because they're a larger team. There are 100 people. Uh, but, but what matters is how you allocate those resources. So 20% content creation, 80% content promotion. Meaning once you spend two hours or 10 hours to create a content piece, you spend the rest 40 hours, four times the amount of time you spend on creation on promotion. And then you move on to the next piece. Love it. Farzad, this sounds like a good moment to wrap it up because that's going to be part two. Um, thanks so much for your time. This has been great. Where's the best place for people to connect with you if they want to talk more about this? Sure. Well, my name is Farzad Rashidi and there are not oh. a whole lot of us out there. So I stick out like a store with them always on LinkedIn. So feel free to yeah, stop by and say hi. I always love to connect with folks. And also download his ebook if you want to learn more about the Farzad formula score. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which is not called that anymore, but get we that going. Call it that. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for your time. And thanks for listening or watching, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. And that's the end of the podcast right there. Hope you enjoyed the episode, but please don't go just yet. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people like you discover us and get the same insights, and it would really help us out a lot. Um, thank you for being a loyal flying cat and for listening. See you next time.